Well, Adam, how are you doing today? Doing pretty well. Been a long day, but happy to be chatting. Well, yeah. thanks. Thanks so much for hopping on at the end of the workday. And um, I, could you go ahead and get started and just give us kind of like a brief bio and some of the big things you're interested in? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think I, my the, the common interest, I'm trained as a scientist. I, I think that my, my main interest has really been in advanced sort of physical technologies since, since I was a teenager. I was interested in nanotechnology. I read a lot of sci-fi books. Um, my, you know, academic training is in physics and biophysics, a little bit in neuroscience, um, but I've always been coming at those sort of from a frontier engineering kind of almost sci-fi engineering perspective, you know, uh, le- less, less so just thinking about um, how to advance the scientific research topic now and more kind of, well, what would be the huge nuclear sledgehammer that we could bring to this problem? (laughs) Um, and so, you know, maybe we can talk about some of that, but that was sort of the approach for better or for worse that I was taking within neuroscience that has, has somewhat led to over the years to the realization that, uh, in some cases, we don't have an organizational mechanism to push hard enough in a concerted enough fashion on certain technologies that impact even very basic research, let alone uh, more product oriented uh, technology. Um, that's sort of led to what I'm, what I'm working on now. That's awesome. And could you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, where you think that gap is like, like where's the gap in like, in either funding or like incentive structures, whatever, uh, to get those, those gains. Well, what I've been talking about with a lot of people, including some of your previous podcast guests like Ben, uh, Reinhard and, and others is that there actually, there are multiple different gaps gotcha. and there are probably multiple different ways of, of fixing those gaps. Um, what my particular lens coming from a couple of different areas, particularly neuroscience, a little bit nanotechnology, sort of biomolecular adjacent sciences has told me is that there, there's also a gap uh, in the development of sort of fundamental platforms and tools that would be used not only by end users, but by researchers d- developing the next generation of knowledge and technology. Um, around tools and platforms and systems, which, which require kind of tight knit concerted systems engineering type approaches to build, but where either the end users of that or the communities that would be involved in building that uh, exist within more of the basic research ecosystem. Um, you know, if you, if you need to make a VR headset or something, you know, that's something where you can get a lot of systems engineering behind it in the context of a company. Um, If you need to make a robot that does brain mapping or a microscope that looks at proteins um, or potentially some other, other, if you want platforms in, in areas that are still somehow pre-commercial for whatever reason, or generating a public good rather than a commercial product for whatever reason. um, I think there's a gap there. That's partly because of how our, our research system is organized where it's sort of fragmented into thousands of individual academic laboratories for the most part um, with less ability to organize kind of startup or industrial like structures for building stuff. Gotcha. So, so it's something where like, you know, maybe the, the, the labs themselves are kind of too small to take on this kind of task. And then like, uh, it's not quite at the level for, you know, it's not close enough for commercialization, like uh, at, the, at the startup phase and like venture capital. Yeah. Um, and so there, there's some like middle ground where, where things are missed and, and where there's kind of, uh, 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 you could do a lot. So right, just- right. I, I think so. And I think a, a lot of it has to do with, again, this, this comes back to the idea of there being multiple gaps, but, but the kind of common theme is, is the idea that, uh, the research system is particularly in the biomedical sciences is sort of a bit homogenous structurally. There are lots of researchers applying for the same relatively small scale grants and training students and postdocs who then want to get into an academic position where they can apply for the similar kinds of grants. Okay. And no, nowhere in there uh, with some notable exceptions um, 
certain large institutes or if you want the sort of startup ecosystem around biomedical tools. Uh, but for the most part, um, it's much harder to, to organize a, a team to build a system where the goal is not to keep participating in that particular system of getting these types of grants and writing the types of gotcha. papers that lead to the, getting those types of grants. That makes sense. So it's something where like the incentives, especially on that, like at the lab level are uh, academic research labs, it, you know, all the graduate students want to get into a similar academic position. You need to publish. Um, so, you know, you like, you got to get your, as many, uh, you know, high end publications as you can to get an academic position. It's intensely competitive. And so like the, the only goal you can really have is like get as many publications as possible to, to make it on the employment ladder. Yeah. You and and, and taking, ladder. taking three years to put together a, a CEO led 20 person team <laughs> and get millions of dollars of funding and move outside the university and th those kinds of activities they would be they would constitute a pretty big risk and a right. divergence from that model it's a bit of an oversimplification lots of people are now increasingly in the last five or six years leaving to do biotech startups instead of doing uh, the academic path um, there are some fantastic new institutes and old institutes that are changing some of this but for the most part um, what your description is is sort of the the, the problem sociological kind of problem setting uh, in the biomedical sciences. And I, I think that that extends to, to other fields in, in, in different ways where uh, people talk about technology somehow being stuck in the lab, but I think it's, it's a little bit more to it than that. It's, it's not that you necessarily want to just take it out of the lab. You might want a different kind of lab um, in which right. a different kind of team is working on that technology, um, even at a pre-commercial or kind of public good or public data set generating phase. That makes sense. I, I really like that. Um, this is a broader question and it's a bit of a left-hand turn, but in, in general, do you think science works better than it has in the recent past, you know, since like the seventies or fifties, the seventies, like, or do you think it's working less well? Do you think it's better about the same? Do you have any sense of that? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that I am a little bit skeptical of the premise of saying quote unquote science and then quote unquote, <laughs> science. Bed quote unquote, better <laughs> or worse. Because right, I think right. That's too, quite broad. It, it can mean, and I, it's, I, I, I don't mean even to push back on it because I think it is a very worthwhile question to ask. But I, I, I think that my personal interest is on kind of hyper-specific uh, and highly heterogeneous uh, kind of cases of this and yeah. sort of finding the ecological niches that may be coming into or out of existence to different degrees. Um, I think that there is a general trend, though, that I, I alluded to, uh, which is, which is a, it's a theory, I think. It's, this is not coming, in my case, from a, a detailed academic analysis of it, but um, that there has been this kind of proliferation of federally funded science in a certain kind of model um, done in universities, which I think on the whole, it's a good thing. And it's a good thing to proliferate. Even. Right. Um, and in no way would I push back. I think there might need to be more PhD students now in the future than there are now. So yeah. it's not, I'm not saying that, oh, there's too many PhD students or something. Um, but, but structurally, uh, there's too homogenous a set of incentives and the parts of the system have become so competitive that uh, there's a kind of a so competitive along so few ecological niches that are meaningfully distinct that kind of a lot of free energy kind of gets sucked out of the system, right? You're spending all your time competing for certain kinds of, uh, of uh, progress that you need in, in, in order to stay in the system. Um, whereas the, my imagination of 50s and 60s science is that there were in some sense, many more ways to do it or many more kinds of scientists and, uh, and sometimes much more trust placed in individuals uh, or sort of more speculative visions, um, potentially longer term activities, um, different kinds of institutes, different kinds of personalities and that we're putting so many requirements on people to be able to get those NIH R01 grants Right. Uh, and, and the equivalence of them for other, other types of researchers that we might be sucking some of the air out of the system at this point. Um, but at the same time, 
other things have emerged like startups uh, right. where you can do extraordinary new kinds of research if you have the right match to a business opportunity. And, uh, and, and, and there's still, there's still lots of really fundamental uh, stuff coming out. Um, you know, I, some fields I think are working incredibly well. Quantum computing, I think is working stunningly well uh, at basically every level from the basic intellectual creativity all the way down to, you know, hardware engineering and commercialization. My impression is that quantum computing, both in the US and other places like China, is just booming and that it would have been very impressive even by 1960s standards, <laughs> maybe even more so because it's proliferating. If you go on the internet on archive.org, you know, you'll see like a hundred quantum computing papers come up every few hours, you know, and, and it's just uh a lot of them are good. <laughs> right. And so it, I think, I think there's some fields that are making really stunning progress overall. We're making a, a pretty decent amount of progress. And then I'm interested in finding the sort of micro niches where you could unlock um, particular types of progress. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. It's really interesting. And and I like your approach and you mentioned free inter- energy and, and, and that reminds me of inadequate equilibria, which I, I know yeah, you've read. That's that exactly where that's from. Yeah, that's exactly. awesome. So I, I, and I, yeah. I found the book on your blog. I was like, Oh, that's awesome. That's, and I, I'm glad you asked about that. Yeah. I, it's, it's a really useful mental framing somehow. I, uh, it's, it's a little hard to capture like what is actually like the thesis of that book that isn't somehow like already known to everyone, but at right. another level, like, it has a lot of useful framings. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's really, yeah, I know exactly what you're saying about the book. Um, and could you talk about that a little bit? Because I think, you know, the area you're looking in, it, it, it's interesting, right? Because it's, it's underserved. Um, and, and, you know, we can talk about FROs a little bit and like more specificity, but um, I, I'm curious, you know, how did you go about thinking like, like, like when you're thinking about this problem originally, like I need to go work on this, you know, how did you think about, you know, okay, like may, you know, why is everyone missing this? You know, I, I guess like, I, and that's kind of a vague question, but like, you know, what was that thought process like? Yeah, it wasn't at all obvious to me. It's, it's, it's the result of, I would say 10 or so years of being in the research system. Um, it was not at all obvious to me that there was a gap of this type. And it didn't come in my case from a systematic analysis of the type Eliezer Yuskowski does in in inadequate equilibrium of these general kinds of incentive traps and, uh, uh, you know, emergent phenomena and systems and stuff like that. It didn't come from that and didn't come from historical analysis. Uh, It just came from an odd situation that I was in where I was this Uh, kind of very bullish, excited new graduate students, maybe a rationally exuberant early graduate student. I had been doing a bunch of physics research as an undergrad. I hadn't had any real obstacles in my way. It was all very fun and exciting. Um, And I was in a grad program in in biophysics with a, a very high freedom fellowship that basically let me do whatever I want, a grad program that would let me do whatever I want, and an advisor that would let me do whatever I want. And so I had this kind of irrational exuberance about the kind of problems that I could pursue as a graduate student (laughs) that in retrospect, you know, anybody who had a decent, my PhD mentor was amazing, but anyone who had a a traditional uh, PhD mentor would have seen the traps that I was getting myself into. But uh, you know, my, the first project that I wanted to do was to try to create a, a fabrication method that would, would allow you to put any molecule at any location on a chip over a centimeter scale with 10 That's nanometer awesome. resolution or something using DNA nanostructures. Uh, and then, then we, we tried to make, um, you know, genes that couldn't mutate. And we, we tried to record all the neurons in the brain into DNA. And we had just a really good time with, with, with really big ideas. But uh, what I struggled to do was to recruit more than a couple people to kind of work coherently with me on these things, right? It was always this dance of writing joint grants with other academic labs and what does this postdoc want to do? And, you know, uh, what do they have funding for versus what do we have funding for? And, 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 and k- kind of um, it, there, there wasn't a, a, a kind of growth model or, or, or development track that was the equivalent of say, hey, we're going to start a startup 
on right. doing molecular recording of neurons in the brain, or we're going to start a, a startup of making a nanometer to centimeter molecular chips. There, yeah. there wasn't a clear model for, for doing that. Um, and so I tried in various settings. I tried in the academic setting and we tried to get both government and philanthropic, you know, large scale grants in the academic setting, particularly to do things around uh, large scale brain mapping approaches. Um, that kind of combine a bunch of technologies in a somewhat high risk and complicated way. Um, eventually, I, I, I sort of tried to do that also in the for-profit sector with a sort of billionaire funded startup um, adjacent to neuroscience um, uh, called Kernel, which was a really great experience uh, where we were able to just pull together teams in this incredible way. I mean, we could, there were, I remember an instance where, you know, one week we decided we wanted to work on uh, uh, atomically precise, mag uh, not uh, atomically pumped uh, magnetometers, um, a, a new, a different way of sensing magnetic fields coming from the brain. And we were like, okay, let's like call up this lab at, at NIST and like find like where all their best postdocs went and like call those up. And like a few weeks later, like we, we had those people, they had like flown to oh, LA awesome. and were like working on like atomic, uh, atom, uh, optically pumped uh, atomic magnetometers. Um, sorry for botching the, 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 what we were actually working on. But, um, and that was, that was really great. Even in that setting, uh, I think there was a very strong pressure to say, what's the near term commercial path right. for this? And uh, it would have been hard for us to be pursuing something just for the good of science or humanity right. uh, or, or neuroscience in with that kind of uh, facility of being able to put in people and invest in, in specific projects. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, I spent some time at DeepMind and I saw their ability to do this really well. Um, this thing that I want, which is the ability yeah. to sort of pull together these tight knit teams and do systems work uh, in something that isn't immediately a product. In this case, an example of what they did was protein folding. Another one was go playing, um, you know, computers. That was really, really impressive. But then I was still sitting there thinking to myself, well, this is great, but this is just AI and computing. How do you right. do it still for biology? And so I just directly, like, I think I just tried by process of exclusion um, given a very lucky situation where I was often very well funded and working with amazing people and having great environments that even in those settings, uh, kind of best case scenario settings, um, and mentors and all that, it was very hard to do this kind of, get this kind of project to exist, even very hard to even spend time talking about it because why are they paying you to spend time talking about that? Right. Um, you're supposed to be doing something useful, like writing a paper or something. Right. Yeah. So anyway, so I, the, I, I found the gap just uh, by, by trial and error. And then now what we've been doing is a couple of us that have found the same gap are now sort of generalizing that and saying, well, putting it, putting, putting words to it. Um, yeah. That That's, that's really awesome. And, um, this reminds me. Th this is a this is a consistent theme I've heard on, on quite with from quite a few guests in, in different ways. Um, have you heard of uh, Don Braben's Scientific Freedom? Sure. Yeah. yeah so we we had Don on. You know, he's like eighty five, awesome. still sharp. It's awesome. Amazing. You know, really really cool guy. Um, but you know, it, it seems really important to you know have a certain amount of slack to pursue like these kind of. You know, it's kind of like uh, you can get stuck in these weird like you know, local in, in places where you can't like get over the next hump. And yeah. um, it, so, so what does it look like? Does, does your model, you know, do you think about it kind of like Don does where you find like, you know, a smart person, smart team, and you just give them kind of unrestricted small, you know, it doesn't even have to be huge amounts of money, but just enough so they get enough flexibility to pursue the research goals. You know, wh what do you think right. it looks like? Yeah. Well, I think what you just said and in, in that model, that, that actually relates to what I was just saying about the, the kind of enviably high freedom situation that right. I was in because uh, in, 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 in realizing these, these types of problems, because uh, if I had had to just write good papers right. <laughs> instead of doing what I, whatever I was doing and brainstorming about uh, nanometer to centimeter chips and stuff. Um, I don't think we would have, even thought up these thoughts. And, and so, so one, one distinction I would make is 
between what is the what is the early stage model that allows people to come up with really new ideas and really new directions and even new meta directions like focus research organizations is more like a meta direction yeah that all relies i think very much yes on this kind of just fund smart people that want to dream about stuff and let them just w- work on those things in a totally self-organized way and none of the outcomes that i've had in my work have been at all predictable even a few years in advance even the places i'm working not predictable right and so i've benefited a lot from that kind of ultra high freedom and i think we need much more of that yeah um then when it comes to the specific projects and the specific teams uh now zooming into a particular idea which is the focus research organizations um that i think requires more of a coordinated set of stakeholders to get involved and and more of a road mapping process and it would actually be potentially a very bad idea to do that on something where there's already startups or where it's just better done as an academic project in the traditional sense Um, so it needs a lot of i think scrutiny uh, of are you hitting a particular bottleneck in the field that you need a public goods generating philanthropic or governmental you know nonprofit org to be formed is it worthwhile for people to take the risk on these projects and divert from what they would otherwise be doing do you have to go through all the hassle and complexity of figuring out teams and roles and compensation and all these things that, right. that startups have to figure out um, it's quite a schlep to create a new organization to solve a problem. It's also quite a schlep for a funder to give people amount of funding that justifies that. We're talking tens of millions of dollars. Right. I think that the focused research organizations are actually a very different, much more directed research, much more goal-driven OKRs, roadmaps, uh, CEOs and teams uh, than what Braben is talking about. But I think fundamentally, like everything comes from like, unrestricted research, including the idea of FROs and probably most right. of the ideas for particular FROs are not going to result from the uh, uh, department of, of FRO uh, right. you know, milestone driven quarterly process. It's going to come from weirdos being supported uh, right. to take unconventional perspectives that are maybe not legible to others for years and, and, but might be legible to uh, a Don Braben uh, who has the benefit of an individual human mind right. uh, talking to someone, you know, not a grant review committee. Definitely. You don't have to win, win over the, 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 you know, a bunch of people. It's like he can, uh, he can understand. And like at the say, early stages, you need someone to trust. So what you're to saying. Trust he, I don't think he does it in a completely blind trust way. I thought, you know, some of the stuff that, that, Ben has said in his interviews with him and, and, and just stuff that he's written about how do you suss out systematically people who not only have an unconventional vision of some kind, but kind of are so obsessively curious about that, that they actually know the specific next step to take. And they can actually have an incredible level of concreteness of what they're right. saying. So you're not just saying, hey, hey I want so, sort of in a purely artistic fashion. I want this thing. I, I have this new idea isn't it great? You're, you're sort of saying you're, you're able to search for people that are, have a unique vision are obsessively curious are so curious that they've actually gotten down to concreteness, have a certain right. level of functionality as people so that they can yeah. get, get stuff done. Um, but it's not something that I think it's a grant committee is the best right. way to do it. I think, I think it is something more like, like a, a individual taste. Uh, yeah. 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 And I think, you're absolutely right. And I think it's something weird where like a, a lot of what's gone on is, you know, because no one gets, wants to get on the front page of the New York times about how all this money was misspent and, you know, you give it to one wrong person, you yes. know, it blows the entire thing up. And, and Don's whole thing was like, you know, yeah, like quacks would call me like all the time and they would say, I've solved this great new advance in theoretical physics. And he'd be like, well, like how would that work? And then they would just never call him back. Which is right. Really yeah. And that's, that's, right? that's really interesting. Yeah. So there, 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 there's, I think that there is more ability for individual people to suss out talent and coherence of other people's ideas, even if they don't totally understand them. Because by definition, like you're, you're, it's not that Don Braben understood everything about theoretical physics right. or something, but, but there, there, I think there are filters that individuals or small groups of people that have honed in on this 
can apply. You probably want multiple different kinds of people with different kinds of filters. Right. But I think we underestimate uh, because it's not legible, because it's not accountable in the right, right ways. We underestimate not only how valuable it is, but also just how possible it is for somebody like Don, Bra- you know, Don Brayman to actually exist. I don't think it's just him. I think that yeah. you can, I think it's actually probably a learnable skill to sort of be like a Don Brayman in, in sussing out out good people yeah which which is which is really weird really weird and, and almost like counterintuitive in in the age yeah. we live in that you know like yeah like don could like have some really good ideas about how the future is going to play out and like it's it's not at all obvious that it should be the case because you could say well you know einstein is by definition so much smarter than you <laughs> that <laughs> distinguishing einstein from a quack pot you know crack pot it may not be, it's not a necessarily an easy problem i mean you how do you how are you going to evaluate einstein's ideas without being smarter than einstein but but uh i've talked to michael nielsen about this a bunch and you know there are people historically that have have done it really well like michael nielsen gave you an example of john wheeler the physicist um like Feynman was a wheeler student yeah. and a bunch of other ones john wheeler was either was that good at selecting or just good at attracting um just yeah i i, I yeah i think we underestimate uh the power of the individual uh, mind a little bit these days and in, in, in finding, finding good stuff. Right. <laughs> and I'm reminded, uh, as who, who talked about this, maybe it was, uh, Peter Thiel in relation to like the clean energy kind of bubble and the, you know, late two thousands. And he talks about Solyndra. Uh, have you ever heard of Solyndra? Sure. Yeah. And, you know, like it, it's like, it's not a flat panel. It's a round pan, like round solar panel. And it's like yeah. whatever pie is efficient is like a flat one or whatever. And it's like yeah. the, the PhD uh, department of energy head in physics couldn't, it wasn't allowed to use, you know, simple high school tools to kind of determine that this was not going to work or something. Mm-hmm. Or Yeah. It, I don't know much weird. about that sp- particular story, but, but yeah, I think it's in this issue of individual agency is sort of, it's an important it's one. I don't. I, I, I somehow heard that Solyndra was actually less of a, 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 a mistake. It was more of a politicized thing. Oh, interesting. Actually, as bad as people said it was, but but I actually don't know the details of that story. So. Fascinating. <laughs> That's cool. That's yeah. cool. Um, <laughs> very interesting. Um, so FROs, like, can you give me an example? Like, what's a really good uh, example or like application? Like, like, what kind of problem would be perfect? Is it something like Manhattan? Is it something like different? Like, what's a good example? Yeah, I mean, the example that I'm often giving, just because this is also this historical one that sort of motiv- motivates it, um, in my particular case, is this idea of, of how do you, how do you map, map brain circuits? Um, and if you think about it, you know, why, why isn't brain circuit mapping a great company right now? Maybe it is, if you had the right investor. You know, if Elon was investing in brain circuit mapping instead of Neuralink, maybe it would work out. Um, so I don't, I don't exclude that it you could do a company on it potentially, but why isn't it in a, in a kind of uh, risk benefit calculation of a venture capitalist kind of a, a great, great bet right now? Well, first of all, there's a bunch of technical risk and a bunch of, a bunch of challenges right. in it. Second of all, it's, it's pretty capital intensive to get up to a level of scale um, where you, like the brain is just really big, honestly. <laughs> and so you have to get up to a, a pretty big level of scale you have to create a lot of baseline data sets and kind of a lot of baseline maps. You know, what is, what is a, a normal mouse brain look like? What does a young mouse brain look like old mouse Got brain it. before you can really say what's going on. That's different in schizophrenia. Um, right. It's because the human brain is so huge. It's actually quite hard to apply this directly to the human brain. Um, so you're often, you're talking about model organisms um, like mice where the application to something like a disease model is speculative uh, in principle, I think this is going to be hugely impactful for artificial intelligence. And we're going to understand the architecture of the brain. It's unbelievable. But drawing a direct path of is, this is at any given time, the best use of an artificial intelligence uh, right. venture capitalist or corporate arms money is to, is to invest in the fundamentals of brain mapping technology. Um, this is a big stretch. So empirically, um, you know, doing you know, $50 million scale technology development projects, which are the in turn upstream of the ability to map the brain uh, circuits f- fast and cheap. That hasn't been an easy sell for, you know, AI companies or uh, mm-hmm. pharma companies or biotech uh, VCs. Uh, and at the same time, it's really a problem that requires a lot of integration of different components into systems in a way that isn't easily sold 
as the greatest idea for your grad student thesis, right? <laughs> right. Like if your grad student thesis um, is about the chemistry for labeling neurons with different colors, um, but then that thesis for it to be useful to anyone, you know, depends very much on somebody creating an ultra fast new kind of microscope so that you can actually image those colors or somebody creating a new kind of virus that can infect those neurons. Or if you have these coordinated problems where you have to solve multiple problems together in one system, um, it's not an easy sell that this is gonna be the best paper that you can write um, in the next two years um, to, to work on, on those components. And even if you did, you might not be well coordinated with other people in other labs um, that, are, that are doing other parts. So, so it's an example that requires systems engineering and focus and scale and multiple microscopes and uh, kind, of, kind of a very concerted approach, but is somehow like fundamentally kind of pre-commercial unless you know, someone like Elon decides that, that, that they will just do it as a kind of risk investment and, and kind of call it a for-profit company and then see if, if they can ride it out long enough. Right, right. So it's just like this weird middle ground. It's just like not, yeah. not really, really achievable. That, that, that's, that makes a lot of sense. Um, that, that actually reminds me, uh, another, another left-hand turn here. But, uh, you know, Robin Hansen's kind of age of M, like brain emulation is a path for AGI. Do you think that's, that's uh, a likely scenario? It hasn't been my particular, like, focus uh, or, like, interest. I think... It's often frustrating to me because I think a lot of the discussion around this gets caught in questions of sort of in principle possibility of these okay. things. And so you have neuroscientists and you have philosophers and stuff saying, oh, this, this is nonsense. It's not in principle possible. Um, I don't think that's the right level to be questioning this. I think, I think with sufficient technology, sir, there, there's lots of philosophical questions. Would it really be you? And so on. Right, right. I'll just... I, but I, uh, I, I don't think that there is really an in principle kind of issue here. Uh, there are some interesting questions like, like uh, Christoph Koch and, and, and some others have this integrated information theory idea about consciousness and in their interpretation, at least as it was a few years ago, if you were to run a simulation of a brain on a classical von Neumann computer, like your laptop with a separate memory and a CPU and everything, that for various technical reasons of their scheme about quantifying consciousness, that that thing wouldn't be nearly as conscious um, than if you made a neuromorphic chip that actually had the physical connectivity similar to the way the neurons are connected in a brain. Super interesting. Um, but even then, I mean, you could make that chip, and I'm also not sure how seriously I take that particular claim. And anyway, so I don't think that there's like a in principle obstacle to doing this necessarily. I think there's just a lot of, you know, is this a practical, desirable outcome that humanity is likely to pursue in the near term? Is that likely right. to, to be something that anybody really wants? Is it likely to be something that uh, comes anywhere near before like very advanced AI of other kinds? Um, I just, it, I haven't been convinced that this is like the, the, this is the ticket, the right kind of framing of any of the stuff that I've been doing. I think of it in terms of fundamentally understanding how brains work, understanding what's different in about a diseased brain versus a healthy brain, um, but not uh, uploading brains per se. Um, but certainly that's a very fascinating book uh, right. and exploration. That's a bit scary about, uh, you know, so where it's a little bit hard to maybe find what's the What's the particular assumption or hold that would make this, I think, somewhat dystopian outcome like right. not happen? Maybe it would happen. Anyway. Definitely, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think that's a very wise observation. Um, well, Adam, so your original background was in theoretical physics. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that was what I did my undergrad on. Yeah, and then and then you kind of you kind of switched into biology. Do you think that gave you kind of a unique perspective, like on the field? It's something that uh, Ed Boyden, who's one of my neuroscience mentors, has has suggested to actively push for in students is to is to make sure that you learn both an empirical discipline and a theoretical discipline. Oh, interesting. Um, the theoretical part being gaining confidence in long chains of reasoning and abstraction and value of upfront design, and the empirical side just being kind of learning from your senses almost and learning 
uh, socially and learning in other kinds of ways that I mean, I personally found biology lab research vastly more difficult than I found any kind of calculation computer-based research. Uh, I think many people actually find that, although some people seem to be naturally good at, at wet lab biology. I certainly was not. Um, but it was, I think, very interesting to expose myself to all that and sort of try to fight through it in various stages uh, because it certainly changes my sense of what, our possible limiting or gating factors in right. project design or um, what kinds of personalities you need involved in projects um, or what can go wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah. Gotcha. So I think, I think, I think that that's something that's, that's really useful. Although mo- most of the time when I see really fantastic computational mathematical people sort of coming and talking, say, Hey, well, you know, what should I work on? I don't usually actually say, Oh, go in forget the fact that you're a really great theorist at the whiteboard and instead, you know, um, do, you know, solder together electronics or, 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 um, you know, uh, dissect embryos or stuff like that. I think that in many cases, people should just do what they like and what they're good at. And, and, uh, but some people, I think having that joint exposure is, is really useful. And there's certain, certainly a, a crew of biologists that are, better than me at both <laughs> that then end up being very successful, um, you know, systems biologists or things by having both. Yeah. Gotcha. I, I think that, that it makes a ton of sense and, and uh, like coming at things from different angles can, can also be helpful. Um, so Adam, you know, other question out of left field. I love questions out of left field, uh, but I've got a lot of diverse interests. So I guess awesome. maybe that's why I don't know. Um, Hit me up. But, uh, you know, what is common knowledge in neuroscience that kind of lay people just don't understand, don't have any idea about, or perhaps even misunderstand? One of the things that I'm not sure even anybody understands. <laughs> um, I mean, I think many of these things are just things that no, nobody understands. Um, but I mean, one of the things that I think is most interesting about neuroscience right now is like this, this interplay between like sort of very uniform or kind of unifying theories and um, just kind of massive like biological heterogeneity. So, so like when, when I was a teenager, you know, among other books that I was reading and whatnot, I was reading like evolutionary psychology books and like Steven Pinker, like how nice. the mind works and various specific, you know, books like that where they sort of talk about this like module you know modular model of the mind right you have a different circuit that's built by evolution for each thing right um you know so you're going to have a mate detector circuit and you're going to have a you know decide you know how to deal with conflicts in my family (laughs) circuit or something right um you have you have a bunch of things and you have you know detect you know uh, you know, all the visual tasks that are specific to hunting or something, you know, you'd have these sort of modules, I, I think is, is part of the idea. And then there's kind of simultaneously this other body of ideas, like the brain is a universal learning machine. It's a universal substrate, computronium kind of substrate. Like Carl like, Friston, like. Yeah, Friston like... and Jeff Hawkins and a bunch of stuff before that. And um, this kind of um, canonical cortical circuits and all that. And I think like, what is like really interesting to me, I, I feel like AI currently is mostly kind of on the more universal models uh, kind of thrust, right? Yeah. Um, what's super interesting to me is like, just how do those combine? I mean, you could say this is just nature and nurture and just how incredibly fruitful the nature and nurture problem really is. It's not a simple right. answer. It's like, uh, you know, um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you, um, uh, want to form relationships as a function of social status or something when you're a teenager or something. And this is a innate biological reaction is to like participate in social status groups or whatever hierarchies that's innate, like primate reaction. Okay, great. But like, how do you detect what a social (laughs) hierarchy is if you can't see you know, if you can't see like the difference between a triangle and a square, 
right? How are you supposed to know the difference between high social status and low social status, right? And so, so, so all these things that seemingly are quote unquote innate, right? They yeah. actually depend a lot on learning too, right? And so somehow yeah. the, the parts of your cortex that self-organize to detect shapes and then ultimately they form this abstract concept of social status or whatever has to somehow plug in and like send the right wire down, you know, to your brainstem circuit that makes you feel in a certain way or whatever. And, you know, so, 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 so you have to have like both self-organized learn stuff and like ultra specific evolved stuff. They have to intersect uh, in, in some way that I think we, we really don't understand. And I think it might be partly that compared to current AI, like basically the brain just has much more complex like learning or training signals or re reward signals. Like it's not just one reward signal. Got it. This is good or bad. It's like this part of your cortex is being trained to do this particular thing that 20 years later will ultimately, you know, influence your, you know, uh, participation in complex social, you know, uh, you know, networks and hierarchies and stuff. Um, but it's being trained you know, not just with, you know, jump generic dopamine, but with some, you know, it's a, it's a very evolved specific thing, this training, a very generic thing. And then you end up with some crazy interplay of those. I don't, don't think we understand it all. Um, so anyway, nature and nurture, I think just how incredibly rich that's going to be for the next like 50 years of neuroscience is like, I think underappreciated. <laughs> definitely. No. Yeah, definitely. That's uh, so much to look into, into and try to understand. It's, and it's all so complex. It's really, it's really fascinating. Um, so you mentioned AI, AI safety, you know, how concerned are you about AI safety and, you know, should we be putting more resources into it, less resources doing okay? What do you think? I'm pretty, pretty, pretty serious about a variety of different potential sort of X risk topics. I think nice. it's something that is sometimes sort of dismissed by the like progress community as if there there there's there as if there's an inherent conflict or something. I th I think it's an important question. I think I think the question is what can we actually do and what can we actually understand now about this? You know, for example, um, coming back to what I was just saying, uh, there's a a really interesting person named Steve Burns. Um, who was a physicist by training um, and then recently sort of dropped out uh, uh, and is supported on, on some kind of fellowship to work on AI safety research. But he's specifically working on this question about uh, given what we know about the biological brain, is there something you can say about AI safety? Um, and when you start to do that, if you, if you take seriously some of the stuff that I was just saying, like, what if there are, instead of one reward function for the brain, uh, as we have in current AI end-to-end -end learned systems, what if you have thousands of individually trained modules that are getting uh, training signals from a subcortical system that is itself a complicated intelligent machine, um, then that starts to look actually quite different as even a basic framing of the AI safety problem is what do you do if you have multiple sub agents or multiple sub, you know, cost functions or so on training it versus this, uh, am I trained to optimize paper clips or am I trained to optimize something else right. more monolithic? Um, and then there's yet other ideas like whether you can make general, very advanced AI without having any kind of agentic, um, emergent agency happen at all. And then there's kind of this higher level thing of what if you have lots of AIs of various kinds, but just civilization, like think about Facebook, yeah. right? Like Facebook in some sense is kind of like a, not a, a GI, but it's kind of civilization and Facebook are sort of maybe kind of misaligned in certain right. ways <laughs> in terms of like at an overall scale. Um, so I think the question is, how do you hone in on the framing and are there any like really interesting, actionable near-term research problems there. Interesting. Um, but like on the margins, you know, the AI safety research that's going on for the most part, I think is very worthwhile because they're taking stabs at these stuff. Right. Uh, and sort of the way I think that, you know, just various kinds of pure math are, are interesting uh, because they kind of give the fodder for whatever's the next round of thinking about this. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm broadly like very supportive of, bunch of AI, different kinds of AI safety research near term and long term that people are thinking about. I'm just not convinced that it's really converged on Got it. 
here's the type of research. Like, t- tell me what, as a program manager, I should fund in AI safety research. It's still very, very unclear to me. Gotcha. So I should be looking into it, but there's there's a lot of different avenues and maybe even ones you know, that aren't broadly discussed yet. Yeah. and But in general, um, AI safety, biosafety, um, I think these are really important things to be. <laughs> yes. you, have to, 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 you have to have the community working on these things or else where's the idea is going to come from? <laughs> Nobody else. will have thought about it. We and don't it, know. It's, yeah, <laughs> uh, but, but it's obviously a, a complicated trade-off because I think a lot of what has galvanized AI safety research in recent years is progress in AI. Yeah. And so I, I'm not into the idea of trying to slow down progress in AI. I right. think you want to actually, in some ways, deepen and the foundations and improve the, the level of rigor, perhaps, of certain kinds of AI. But... Uh, but it's it's not that you you slow it down. It's that these things have to kind of come in lockstep. Right. But if we if we somehow say AI safety, this is all bullshit. You know, right. okay. I'm gonna swear on your podcast. If we say something like this, uh, then then we're really excluding something that's very important. So yeah, and and I'm definitely with you. One of my, I I think I, very much in the same vein of your thing. I think AI safety is important to think about, and also. I think it's it would be very bad to like oh we can't do anything with AI no more research you know just like cut it off because I think it's you know computer computers is one of the few are it's one of the few areas of our society where you can still you know make a lot of progress you know it's it's it, there's you don't have the FDA like stopping yeah. you and, and like I I don't want it like just to, we're gonna stop now no more AI research and then you know there, there's all these another one that effects. I think is maybe sort of neglected is. Um research on sort of broadly the category of thing that Facebook does like recommender systems and influencing human behavior and oh, uh, s- surfacing information and propagating information in networks, but that is sort of more for the public benefits, right? right. So you, you could imagine uh, versions of Twitter algorithms that are actually searching for correct information as opposed to viral information or so on. But right. that I feel like those are tools that we should be able to, I should be able to get a Chrome extension that looks at my Twitter and sort of helps fact check me or helps recommend me a different set of content that's more beneficial to right. me uh, long term. Um, and so we're actually even thinking about whether there are kind of focused research organization type problems in, in sort of that that space of in, improving improving human reasoning, improving discourse. Um, and th- those are also, I think, like a broader AI safety kind of yeah. question. Of, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you look at, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen like a, a younger person using TikTok and, you know, it's like recommender system. It's just, they're just swiping for hours and it's not clear there's really any social benefit to it at all, you know, like. Yeah, or or us, uh, right. you know, and, 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 that feels to me like it is um, one of these areas where uh, there's kind of this this disproportionate balance of power, uh, oh, yeah. kind of on the on the the the, the selling ads side yes. of things versus on the kind of uh, humanity figures out how to use these things really well. Um, so maybe 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 we need a sort of public benefit, um, you know. Uh, gigawatts of computing kind of right. uh, situation exactly. um, for 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 some of these alternative approaches. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I, before we jump into overrated, underrated, I have one more question. It, it's kind of a broad question, but you know, so you've been working on this stuff, you've been thinking about it since you know, at least since you were a teenager, you know, making progress in, in neuroscience and um, all these related fields. You know, have you gotten more bull, more bullish on your ability to make progress? Um, over the years, less bullish, you know, maybe it varies over time. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm more optimistic now than I've been in a while. That's awesome. Um, I think that we're, what's funny to me with the focus research organizations is it's sort of a very simple idea. Um, yeah. you know, it's, uh, and yet it's kind of getting traction, I would say in both the philanthropic and government settings. And it makes me optimistic of just sort of if you really just articulate very clearly what you want and you kind of go around yelling about it um, and you have the right network and right, right, yeah. in certain ways and you, 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 you try to try to be rigorous in certain ways, but um, I'm optimistic about the pot more optimistic now about change in the organizational side, the funding side. Nice. I think there's a lot of post COVID stuff. Um, there's a lot of stuff from, from, from uh, cryptocurrency and the set of people that made a lot of money on cryptocurrency and what, what they can do 
to, to, to fix science. Um, so I'm, I'm very optimistic about the set of organizational and funding modalities that are spinning up now that I feel like really, you know, there certainly were when I was describing the early period of being in yeah. grad school, sort of being disillusioned about, about what can we do? There, there, I mean, that was around the same time, you know, DeepMind and other kinds yeah. of things were being started. And so there certainly was a lot of organizational innovation, you know, the Allen Institute and a bu- bu- bunch of bunch of other great things. But I, I, I personally feel like the the prolif- there's a proliferation right now um, of potential to create new organizational modalities for these things. It's super exciting, um, whether they be PARPA or FROs or um, you know, bespoke institutes for particular problems or any number of other things. That's really good. That's really good. A little, little note of hope there. I, I really like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so overrated, underrated. Um, I'm just throwing a term out. <laughs> just tell me it's overrated, underrated. Uh, and maybe a sentence why, you know, if you got something. I love this. <laughs> right. And, and maybe it's correctly rated. I don't know. Um, so George Church, overrated, underrated? Oh, still underrated. I mean, still, still underrated. Absolutely. Um, he, you know, he's, you know, he's in mid sixties. He's starting to be recognized, <laughs> but <laughs> just no. So, I mean, he, I, I, I think that, um, so many, so many ideas, um, you follow them a few steps back and, yeah. and you get to George either as a catalyst of those ideas or as the actual like, human That's origin awesome. of those. And, uh, he's, he's just so supportive. And, you know, I, I think of it, actually, I talk about it a lot with, with FROs is, yeah. You know, how, how are you going to do, uh, make some a really exciting environment for someone to work in an FRO if you're not giving them startup equity from the beginning? Um, right. Because, you know, depending on how they, they're done, uh, they're, you know, they're often going to be, you know, 501c3 nonprofits or, or subsidiaries right. of, of that. Or, um, <laughs> and I think about the church lab where it's a, it's a, it's a university, but it's basically like a startup incubator without even trying, right? Because right. it just gets so many great people. And then the things that they do afterwards are so shaped by that uh, and by the presence of that network that they, uh, you know, it, it changes their opportunity space to just hang out there. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I really want new research organizations to sort of have, have that character where it's not that you have to necessarily make money off of something directly, but, but you benefit by being at the ground floor of right. a huge amount of entrepreneurial activity. Yeah. How do you get some of the upside? Yeah. And to think, you know, eight, down, eight miles down the road from here at Dick, you know, they kicked him out, you know, <laughs> like you're not coming to class. Yeah. You know, like, holy crap, you know, guys, geez. <laughs> Look, Duke, Duke is a really awesome place. Uh, they can allow to make one or two <laughs> mistakes. That's probably, if you know, that's a <laughs> really big mistake. The... Right. That's that a big mistake. Uh, <laughs> um, Neuralink, uh, overrated, underrated, kind of correctly rated. What do you think? Depends on who you ask. So I, I think that the neuroscience community, uh, s- some subset of the neuroscience community, I think underrates it somewhat. I think that gotcha. there's a, te- a tendency to sort of say, well, look, the data that they've produced isn't anything particularly special scientifically. Um, so let's just discount the fact that that microchips and surgeries and stuff that they've been yeah. developing and packaging and all the engineering is much less, it, 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 it is just so much more advanced and so much more of a step towards real human applications yeah. um, than kind of much more clunky um, engineering that's been done in the past, um, wireless transmission of the data. So I, I think that there are certainly some that underrate them. I think that the particular approach that they're taking of putting lots of little electrodes in the brain is overrated. Um, I think that it's actually very hard to avoid some of the things that they're working on, but, but, you know, immune responses in the brain, hitting gotcha. blood vessels, right. um, getting very wide coverage, not having to make a, a, a invasive and infection prone uh, surgery. Right. Um, and there are certain things where you can substitute, you know, for, for even for severely disabled, paralyzed uh, people where even non-invasive technologies can still, still give a lot of benefit. And so the cost benefit for that particular type of highly invasive technology I'm less into, but, you know, I'm still very into brain interfaces. And uh, I mean, I think that Neuralink is a generally a, a positive force in the world. And nice. Yeah. Do you think there'll be like less invasive interfaces that will come along that are kind of a superior approach? Eventually, eventually, eventually. I mean, DARPA actually has a, a program called, I think it's called N cubed. 
uh, which stands for non-invasive and non-surgical neurotechnology, nice. which combines some of these ideas of non-invasive measurements like Colonel is working on yeah. with other ideas like sort of nanoscopic transducers, whether they be biological or something else that help those non-invasive technologies to actually pick up a signal because oh, cool. the, you know, neurons in your brain are not evolved <laughs> to, to be able to be sensed by some right. piece of hardware. <laughs> they don't care. Um, but if you can put little transducers in there, that, that can, can make it much more powerful. Um, so down the line, but I think we're talking decades down the line, I think, yes. Um, and I'm also optimistic about certain kinds of near-term things in neurotechnology, medical applications and, and new kinds of deep brain stimulation or ultrasound stimulation or other things. Um, but I'm just not um, on board that the particular device Neuralink has shown so far is going to be the link. Like the thing. The right. link gotcha. that, that, the iPhone of neural interface. Yeah. Right. right. Just yeah. plug in that lightning cable right up there. Um, the Manhattan Project, overrated, underrated? Gosh, that's the complicated one. And, uh, you know, I feel a little bad for, for in one of my early tweets about FROs, I, I refer to as mini Manhattan projects. And some yeah. people said, well, you know, not everybody thinks the Manhattan project was a great outcome um, for, for humanity. Yeah. Um, and many of the scientists that worked on it, I don't think think of it as a great outcome. Um, but boy, um, the combination of um, organizational and technical excellence of the absolute best Just in the world on both out. fronts uh, and truly pushing on something that was life or death, uh, underrated, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, have you read, uh, now it can be told by general Groves. I no. highly recommend it. He, you know, he, he, and you just, uh, so he's the guy, he, you know, general Groves, he managed the, sure. the he's yeah. kind of like the management side of the army yeah. Corps of engineers, you know, and he like picks, you know, in the early parts of the book, he, you know, he picks Oppenheimer and the entire army leadership's like, you can't pick him because, you know, he's like, yeah, drama with his politics. They don't align. And General Graves is like, I don't care. He's the best. That's yeah. the one we're going with. And like all this just story after story of like how they just willed this into being. And like, and, and yeah. you're right. You know, the, there's obvious downsides to having atomic vibes and there's a lot of bad things that happen. But the technical accomplishment in such a short period of time is very impressive. It's, it's extraordinary. Yeah. No. So, so in, in general, I, so I, I uh, have a two five hour car rides coming up uh, next weekend and uh, planning to, to have an audio book of uh, Richard Rhodes, The Making of the Atomic Bomb uh, nice. as my, my backdrop. Yeah. That's awesome. That's going to be good. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully so. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, Adam. Thanks so much for coming on. Do you have any parting thoughts and where can people find you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, great, great to chat. Um, awesome questions. And yeah, um, yeah, you can Google uh, Adam Marblestone or I have a website um, still linked to my old MIT address and uh, you can Google focus research organizations and find our white paper about that. Um, yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Adam. Really appreciate it. Thanks so it. much.